Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the final session of Rackspace Solve San Francisco. Now, once again, please welcome the CTO of Rackspace, John Engates. When I met you in the summer. All right. Welcome back. I hope you had a great afternoon in the breakouts. I know we learned a lot here in the main stage, and I'm sure it was the same in the other breakouts. And really, to close out the day, we have a very special guest here today. Um, Lila Tritikoff is here with us. She is the um, executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation. She's also a Rackspace board member. She has a long uh, track record of, of success in, in the tech industry. And she's come, gonna come out here and join me. And um, we're gonna have just a few questions with Lila to close out the day and talk about the future. Lila, why don't you come out and join me? Welcome. Thank you. Have a seat, please. So, before I get into the questions, um, would you just tell us just a little bit about your background, what you've been doing in your career, and uh, you know, and tell us a little bit how you came to this new position of executive director of Wikimedia. So a little bit about me. Um, I am actually, uh, I'm foreign born. I grew up in Moscow. Um, very, very interested in mathematics. Started college early um, in math. And then when I came here, I went to Berkeley for computer science. And specifically, I was, uh, I was majoring and focusing on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So very much a techie at heart. Mm -hmm. But techie was a little bit of an art player as well. So. Um, I ended up uh, starting a company straight, straight out of school, selling that, uh, going back into kind of mainstream workforce, did some mobile, did banking actually of all things, uh, and then uh, did, uh, um, uh, was the CTO at Sugar Serum, and after that uh, joined uh, Wikimedia as basically the chief executive. So CIO, I saw and I looked at your background, CIO and VP of Engineering at Sugar CRM. CIO, then VP of Engineering, oh, so both, okay. then CPO. I run almost, uh, God, I run a lot of functions. So lots of startup background, lots of getting, you know, you open source, you know a lot about that. Oh, very much so, since yeah. my Berkeley days, yeah. So is that why they uh, selected you for Wikimedia? You know, I think uh, uh, for the Wikimedia Foundation job, they really wanted somebody who was kind of a renaissance person. Um, they wanted somebody who was really uh, well-versed in products, of course, because it's, it's a product. Uh, um, from the foundation's perspective, that's what we do for the most part. Um, they wanted somebody who really understood the world uh, and the challenges uh, with free speech and problems, economic problems, as well as uh, political issues around that. And growing up in, in Moscow during the opening, the, the Perestroika and Glasnost years, I really uh, soaked uh, in all of the challenges that, uh, that have to do with that. Um, and they wanted somebody who was operational, operationally solid as well. And because I have been a, C a CEO before, founding CEO, and because I, uh, I've run so many different functions, it was just the right match. Well, I, I know uh, Wikipedia because I have two kids. I have an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old, and they use Wikipedia for their projects nowadays. And that's kind of the, the thing I think most people think of is, is Wikipedia. But what mm -hmm. is Wikimedia beyond what we think of as the encyclopedia for the internet. Yeah, yeah, so Wikimedia is the foundation behind it. And there are many projects beyond Wikipedia. They're not as large or as well known as Wikipedia itself. Um, so there's Wik Wiktionary, there's Wikicodes, there is uh, um, Wikisource, books. Uh, so a lot of different projects that are all, um, what they have in common is their collaboratively created content. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's just incredible, the communities that are around them and the people that are building them. And keep in mind, also Wikipedia is available in 287 languages. And this is not the same content. It's not just translated content. It's completely generated unique from scratch. Content, yeah. unique. Which, is your fa which is your favorite project of all those? 
<laughs> that is an, an unfair, unfair question. question. You're not allowed <laughs> yeah. to ask that. Or? There is, there's really it's like your children, which is the favorite. Yeah, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that. Um, but it's really incredible because people actually, it's an open source project. So people um, end up uh, building this really cool extensions and they end up building new projects. The one that I am very interested in right now is the, uh, it's called Wikidata. What it is, it's a semantic engine, uh, a semantic database underneath uh, Wikipedia that actually uh, stores all of the tuples of data um, underneath it. So, uh, so you can find out a lot of things about relationships and, um, and specific objects, but also translate them very easily into all the different languages. So your background, I, I think you did research in machine learning. Mm -hmm. uh, is Wikipedia intended for just humans, or is it intended for some machines as well? I mean, tell, tell me about, I mean, I'm, I'm no machine learning expert, but I'd love to hear your take on where you think Wikipedia, Wikimedia projects are going in terms of um, you know, Internet of Things and you know, how, how they're going to be consumed or produced over the next five to ten years. It's a, you know, it's a fascinating topic. You know, I can, I can talk, I talk about it you know, for, for a very long time. But what I think is really, really interesting is that um, we are in the world where machine intelligence is really rapidly evolving. We finally get, got to the point where uh, computing became so ubiquitous and so scalable that we can really apply those algorithms. So machine learning algorithms existed for, oh my God, like 30 to 50 years, you know. Uh, some of them have been around for a long time, but we haven't been able to really fully utilize them because we did not have the parallel processing power. And today we do. Um, as, as you all know, just Rackspace alone, servers, uh, servers are available. You can just spin them up on, uh, in the blink of an eye, and all of these computing resources are available to you. What this means is, the, uh, is that the learning process that used to take machines very long time, um, and because of the computing, uh, computing needs, now can be done in parallel and can be done really, really fast. So we're going to see, and we're already seeing, um, uh, this computing uh, time shrink and the really valuable insights are being available for us at the, you know, at the blink of an eye. This combined with um, the Internet of Things and just availability of data about us is incredibly powerful because now we can create, we can get insights. So for example, let's say if you have a huge repository of medical data fully, let's say, anonymized, but you have information about demographics, age, um, locations, diet, things like that. You can predict with much higher probability outcomes of a, of a patient taking a particular dra drug than you uh, could have done with 10 years of study. Mm. So this is just one example of how you can apply machine learning to the information that's human generated and oftentimes cu human curated, but um, Processed with, uh, with with uh, with some of these algorithms. So, in terms of um, processing, I mean, are you at Wikipedia or the Wikimedia Foundation? I mean, how, first of all, how how who runs it? Who runs the infrastructure behind the scenes? I know mm -hmm. it's a lot of volunteers behind Wikimedia. Yes, it's a huge community of volunteers. Uh, the foundation actually runs the servers at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Just Managing, managing the machines, managing the operating systems. The foundation does that, but uh, the volunteer community is very, very involved in actually writing and uh, also maintaining a lot of the software. Right, and that I assume is uh, you know that infrastructure, the software behind it, it grows constantly. I mean, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I keep signing those checks. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of scary. I, just, I bet it is, and and it, and I assume that. Uh, you know, over time, as the price of computing continues mm -hmm. to go down and as the you know, ubiquity of cloud computing yeah. goes further and further, you guys can start to do more cool and interesting things. You know, we heard from Walmart today that, about how they moved from a, from a traditional architecture to a private cloud. Mm -hmm. um, are you guys, at, uh, people, I shouldn't say guys, I should mm -hmm. say people <laughs> at Wikimedia Foundation, Thank you. Are, are, we, um, are, are we exploring kind of the new paradigms for how those architectures are going to be deployed? Or are we? Well, yeah, we all, we run OpenStack uh, in our uh, in our environment. In fact, we have a lab environment in which we have uh, what the, the reason it's called labs is because um, volunteer community actually writes a lot of code and they deploy those things. They're deployed in production. 
good production stuff, but they run in this uh, in the cloud computing environment that's really easy to scale. So it's just one of the examples. I think it's going to get even uh, much more important that we have the right infrastructure and the right uh, systems underneath because mm -hmm. we're now starting to see that all of this data that we were talking about just now earlier and all of this computing needs specialized types of architectures. Um, and this is what, uh, well that, that is what we're, we're starting to see. We, for example, we need graph databases mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to just having relational databases. Um, you know, that's just one of the examples. Right, right. Lots of, I mean, that's one of the things we hear from customers regularly is that it doesn't work anymore to just have one database mm -hmm. flavor. You have that's to right. have multiples to, to store data in different ways to access it. Sometimes it's optimized for different things. Um, you know, I, I'd love to ask you a ton of, like, the, the geek questions, <laughs> but I, I actually pulled a bunch of rackers, and they wanted to ask you a lot of questions about, you know, kind of the, the Wikipedia project. Um, you know, what... What do you say to someone who's never participated as a contributor? I think you had, you, they kind of called you out for not having done, oh, yeah, for I'm not having contributed to Wikipedia. And, yep. and so what, when you, at this point, you're, you're traveling the world. I heard you have a hectic travel schedule. What do you tell people about Wikipedia? How do you get started? How do you get to contributing? And what's your advice? You know, the reality is people start in different ways. But uh, the most common way is actually somebody just sees either sees a mistake, grammar error or whatever, uh, formatting error. Um, sometimes they uh, notice there's something new that's worth updating. In an article, they just click edit. They put little, uh, a little note there. Um, and that's it. Um, often, often, oftentimes, people don't even log in. Like my son the other day fixed something. He mm -hmm. stands. Um, so the biggest barrier really is clicking on that edit button and feeling like you are competent enough mm -hmm. to um, to edit the world's repository of data, right? And uh, I think getting over that feeling, I think, is actually pretty much the biggest barrier for people today. So if you see something, you, you know, you're on the sports page, you notice that your favorite team, you know, scored a new game, yeah, you can edit there. Just don't forget to add a reference to where the original source is. I'm gonna ask the audience a question here real quick. Uh, first of all, raise your hand if you've ever used Wikipedia. Okay, so that was the easiest question in the world because <laughs> I assume everyone has at one point or another. But here's the next question. How many have you have, have you have contributed? How many of you have changed something? Okay, so it's a, yeah, let's give the, the hand to those folks. That's it. That's an important thing, you know? Uh, yes, you've contributed. You, you've contributed to the World Repository of Knowledge. And, you know, the most important thing is uh, the fact that somebody learned from it. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's, that's the amazing part. You know, you, you, I, I travel the world and I see this next generation of kids that are growing up, they don't know the world without Wikipedia. And it's, it's amazing to them, like your kids and my kids, and you are, you are the people who, who, are, who made it available for them. And you know, my, my, biggest regret, my deepest gratitude <laughs> go out to, to those who contribute. So here's another question that came from a racker. They wanted to know what does a typical day look like in Lila's world? Will you travel? <laughs> what do you What do you do? What do you do at uh, w in in the organization? Is so it like everything? Do you do you kind of roll up your sleeves and do anything, or or is it sort of a, a very cut and dried <laughs> role? Um, you know, it's it's really varies. Sometimes it's pretty uh, pedestrian. Uh, you know. It could be uh, really simple things, just going through uh, and looking at quarterly reviews and figuring out what we're going to be doing next quarter and things like that. And sometimes it's thinking about how we're going to fight uh, uh, for freedom of speech uh, somewhere in, uh, um, in a remote part of the world. You know, it's really you never know what's going to uh, to come your way. Does it cross over time. into politics? Does oh, it, absolutely, yeah? of course. Of course, very much so, because a lot of the issues, what, what we're seeing right now, technology is such a force. And at the same time, um, the legislature has not yet caught up, caught up even with understanding of it. Right. Um, so it's really, uh, it's, it's a really huge, and, and oftentimes it's a huge barrier because mm -hmm. there are laws against, for example, you know, uh, freedom of panorama in uh, uh, in Europe, where you just you can't even take a picture of uh, of a building, 
you know, and that's that's a legal barrier uh, for us to document our world around us. Uh, so absolutely, we get involved. Yeah, I think that same thing is playing out, you know, in cloud computing. It's just the, you know, mm -hmm. especially with the security and the spying and, you know, all these countries oh, trying to make sure so. that they're, uh, you know, keeping up with the rest of the world. They, they want to make sure that they secure everything behind their walls and their that's borders. Right. That's sure right. Sure, that's the same kind of a thing with Oh, absolutely. What we're seeing is that the world is starting, the internet is starting to get fragmented as a result because the government's um, understanding of it and uh, approach to it is basically a lockdown uh, network at the, border, uh, at the border because it's such a powerful weapon at the end of the day. Just a, one more geek question for you. Uh, does Wikipedia run in one place in the world or do you have like lots of different Wikipedia deployments to, to get around those kind of uh, regulations and laws and, and uh, po political yeah. barriers? <laughs> um, no, we, we have caches around the world, but all of the data centers are in the United States. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so one, I maybe have one, maybe one more question here. Uh, because, you know, Wikimedia is volunteer driven, is it different than your history in Silicon Valley? Is it, you know, how is it different? How is it like open source or, you know, uh, what's the parallel there? Uh, it's different in some ways and, and similar in others. Um, so from the volunteer perspective, absolutely it's different um, because volunteers in front, is front and center of what we do. There are primary, what you would call normal world customers. Um, and it's, you know, our primary mission is to make sure that we support them. Uh, on the other hand, we're still a tech kind of company. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that we produce uh, good software, that we keep the servers up, you know, there's the same kind of challenges that you will see in a, in a normal environment. The open source component is really has to do with the culture. And uh, this is why I like, um, I love Rackspace as well, because the culture is so vivid. It's very much about, I've got this idea and I just get, I'm gonna go and do it and I'm gonna make the right call, I'm gonna do the right thing. And you have the freedom to do that. Um, and, and I think that's, that's incredibly refreshing and powerful and that's, that's what open source, I think, culture kind of brings in. Okay, this is my last question, I promise. What excited you about joining the board at Rackspace? You just mentioned culture. Is there anything more to it than that? What, tell me about that. Oh, I think the opportunity is unbelievable. Like we were talking about, um, a specific, you know, about all of the algorithms that, and all of the incredible problems that we can solve. Well, in order for us to solve it, we need the computing, we need the right kind of computing. Because I actually think that Rackspace is uniquely positioned because privacy is going to become more and more and more important. Mm -hmm. So uh, things like private cloud are going to become critical for companies because they're going to be required to protect their customer data. So I think that it's, it's an incredible space. We can solve huge problems and, uh, and I think we can do it because we have the right people. Very cool. Thank you, Lila. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell my girls that I got to ch chat with somebody from Wikipedia, and they're going to think it's the coolest <laughs> thing because they're constantly going there. Thank you very much for Thank joining us so today. Much. Give it up for Lila Tretikoff, please. <laughs> All right. So to uh, truly wrap us up, I'm going to invite our president and CEO back to the stage. You saw him this morning, Taylor Rhodes. Please welcome Taylor Rhodes to the stage. <laughs>